I want to thank everybody who's come out tonight. And I also want to thank um, people who are joining us remotely. I know that a number of people may not feel safe attending these events publicly. There's been instances at, at prior such events of people being filmed, perhaps as some sort of implicit threat. We know what you're doing. We know even if you're not in China. So I know it can be difficult for some people to come out. So we just wanted to say, for those of you who are watching remotely, we appreciate you watching too. Um, as Susie said, we're here tonight to discuss a really difficult topic, and that is uh, what's going on in, in the Xinjiang Uyghur Autonomous Region, and most notably the detention camps that have been uh, set up there since April 2017. We're going to talk a little bit about you know, what we've been able to piece together on the camps based on international reporting, that there's a million or more ethnic minorities, ethnic and religious minorities being held in these camps. Uh, there are places where detainees are subject to, at the very least, what is euphemistically called political re-education, but at worst may include torture. Um, and now, thanks to RFA's really great reporting, we know that some de detainees may be even transferred into inner China because the, the camps are so overcrowded. We've heard from reporting that incredibly small infractions, say growing a beard too long or refusing to drink alcohol, could get someone locked up in one of these camps. And we know that even outside the camps, uh, we, Uyghurs, Kazakhs, and other minorities are subject to omnipresent surveillance, including having government cadres come and live at, with them and monitor them in their own homes. These camps have functionally orphaned Uyghur and other minority children. They've emptied out city streets. And they've inflicted emotional trauma on an entire generation of people. And, uh, and further, the effect of these camps as you all probably know, reaches well beyond Chinese borders. Uyghurs and Kazakhs living abroad, and we'll hear more about this later, are pressured to remain silent, often by their own family members who are under duress back in China. Of course, if a Chinese government spokesperson, we're here right now, uh, he or she would vociferously deny any allegations of human rights abuses in Xinjiang. In recent weeks, the Chinese government has gone from denying that the camps even exist to touting them as facilities that are designed to teach Mandarin Chinese as well as combat extremism and terrorism. They are setting up institutions to provide people affected by extremist thoughts with vocational skills training and psychological counseling. And that's where we're going to start our discussion this evening. And frankly, all of this information that I've just laid out for you is really, really overwhelming, and it's really difficult to know where to begin. So I'm going to start by asking Ryan to try to zoom out a little bit and fill in the history and context of what's happening right now. So Ryan, I was hoping you could tell us briefly in general about the Xinjiang Uyghur Autonomous Region. Where is it? Who lives there? And if you can just give us a sense of the history maybe up until last year when we started learning about these camps, like what was the state of play? Okay. Um, all right. Well, I'm a historian, so I'll zoom way out. Yeah. <laughs> and I'll, I'll, I'll start in 1760. Um, when the um, Manchu Qing Empire conquered the um, uh, uh, Jungar steppes and the Tarim Basin and squeezed them together and named them Xinjiang. Um, and which the, means? Which means new territory. Um, and uh, the people who were living there, the people who the, the Qing Manchus conquered were in the north, uh, uh, Mongol nomads, and in the south, primarily... Um, uh, agricultural Turkic-speaking people who are the ancestors of the folks who now call themselves um, uh, Uyghurs. Uh, so today we we have essentially uh, the PRC inheriting um, the imperial conquest of the Manchu Empire uh, some 260, 270 years ago. Um, and uh, we have a large population of multiple ethnic minorities, Uzbeks, Kazakhs, Kyrgyz, Tatars, um, uh, Uyghurs, I think I mentioned them, which are the largest uh, minority group. Um, and ever since that conquest in 1760, the indigenous population of the regions that were put together to create Xinjiang um, has to various degrees uh, express, expressed dissent or displeasure with being ruled from uh, Beijing. There have also been times when the uh, rule of uh, China-based states has been somewhat popular. Um, but important for tonight's discussion is the fact that there are multiple acts of rebellion, 
um, milder forms of resistance like writing poems or, or novels that uh, express a, a longing for some sort of um, um, <clears throat> ideal uh, form of uh, indigenous-based sovereignty. I think what we're seeing now is an attempt by the Xi Jinping government to answer in a more definitive way what Chinese, China-based states, Beijing-based states in particular, have been concerned about for the last 260, 270 years, which is how to stop um, this very continuous um, uh, expressions of resistance and discontent with outsider rule in, in the region. And um, the very proximate recent change that has accelerated things is the appointment of a new um, uh, provincial top official, Chen Chuanguo, who earned a reputation in Tibet for having Re- with remarkable success, um, squelched uh, uh, protest in, in Tibet. And so uh, Xi Jinping, when looking to finally bring a sort of perpetual security, as, as, as he sees it, um, to, to this uh, uh, imperial inheritance, um, appointed Chen Chuanguo, who, who has enacted all of these policies. And really quickly, just to follow up, maybe can you explain a little bit how these camps in particular, these detention camps, which we talked about, represent a change from the status quo ante? Because there were a couple of camps that had already been set up before Chen got there. Like, what is, what is actually the, the change? Is it just the number of people? Is it the methods? Um, so there, there were camps in both, both in Tibet and, and there was a re-education program in Xinjiang, which was largely, uh, what's the word? It was like daytime re-education, mm-hmm. where you could go in during the day, and then you could come back and uh, live in your own home uh, at night. But they're also quite similar to the re-education camps for Falun Gong. So I think that's probably the better uh, precedent for this, because the Falun Gong re- re-education camps have been And for those who don't know Falun Gong is? Falun Gong is... Um, uh, 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 a religious uh, tradition, I guess it's quite it's quite recent. It develops in the 1980s, 1990s, out of the um, uh, Qigong, the, what people in the U.S. might recognize as tai, uh, something similar to Tai Chi, um, mixing Buddhism and bits of Christianity and other things together. Um, and Falun Gong is seen as a threat to um, social order in in China by the uh, Communist Party of China. So these these kinds of this kind of uh, approach to thinking that the Threats to stability lie in the thoughts of the population, and that you can fix those thoughts and there, thereby create stability. This was tried out already with the with the Falun Gong, um, but uh, here we see it deployed. What's kind of new about it is, on the one hand, its scale. Um, estimates are between several hundred thousand and uh, over a million uh, people being put in these camps. That's five to ten percent of the Uyghur uh, ethnic population. So its scale and it's, it's the fact that it's directed along racial or ethnic lines is something that's, uh, that's quite new and developed with remarkable um, speed. I mean, to, to, to put that many people uh, behind barbed wire fences uh, within two years is a pretty incredible uh, feat of, of, of infrastructure <coughs> development, actually. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. I want to turn now, now that we have a bit of context for what's happening right now, I want to turn to Golchera, who is here to talk to us a little bit about her personal experiences as a Uyghur who has family members and has had to deal on a very personal level with what's happening. So if you could just really quickly tell us first, when you first came to the U.S., why did you come and and what are you doing here right now? Thank you for this uh, opportunity. Uh, my name is Gulchekra Hoja. I'm a U.S. citizen. I'm also Uyghur. I'm a Uyghur journalist in uh, RFA. I joined uh, Radio Free Asia since 2001. After I just start my work here, uh, my family uh, been targeted because of my work because uh, our station. Uh, Radio Free Asia, Uyghur service is the only um, free uh, sources, free news sources for Uyghur region uh, and outside of uh, Uyghurs. 
So we focus on uh, China's Uyghur human rights violations. Uh, we interviewed uh, Chinese officials, police, and the local residents. And um, Communist Party, uh, Chinese Communist Party sees us like um, uh, first enemy of uh, Chinese Communist Party. So uh, my family was in close watch many years. Uh, the when the authorities began the re-education camps and uh, me and my other five colleagues, uh, family members, uh, targeted and <sighs> So my worries come true when I learned my brother, uh, Kaiser Kim, was detained in uh, September 28, uh, 2017. He was driving my mother to a doctor appointment when he was taken after uh, stopping at the gas station. Uh, he left my mother in the car and told her uh, not to worry, but never come back. Uh, a relative uh, had to come to get my mother, uh, who later asked police for information. They refused to give anything beyond saying that uh, my brother was at the re-education center to the um, to be locked after she later spoke uh, with him by Skype at the police station he put on a brave uh, face and uh, said not to worry and uh, that he's okay but my mother knew he was suffering uh, months went on when I heard after that my parents both in need uh, of constant medical care, were hospitalized, but they were taken into facilities in the detention camps, not being able to talk with my mother or father, <coughs> or learn how they were doing was almost too much to bear. Being almost uh, 77,000 miles away, I feel so helpless even more than when my poor brother was taken. I tried to contact other family, but couldn't reach them also. So later I learned more than 20 people my, uh, of my close relatives taken to the call re-education center. Um, So they punish it because of my work, because of me. Um, so after I start raising my voice, because our people, millions of people, are voiceless in the re-education camps and the Uyghur region, they need attention. They need help. Just right down mentioned in the articles and the other scholars says it's not the education camp. It's more like Nazi camps. So we should take action before too late. I just can't say that much. Thank you. Thank you. Um, James, I was wondering if you could talk to us a little bit about how, in your experience, the Chinese government has thought of or treated 
ethnic minorities generally and how specifically that's played out in Xinjiang and, and particularly with the terrorist connection um, or at least their emphasis on terrorism and and also you know I mean what we just heard is is horrifying and 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 really affecting and so how do ethnic majority Han Chinese think about this do they know about it and if so what do they think okay. sorry I just lobbed a lot of questions at you <laughs> so the the history of treatment of ethnic minorities under the PRC um, is mixed it's changed quite dramatically in the last decade or so um, at first so initially you have this sort of idealistic vision um, that is never really fulfilled on the ground but which many people believe in which is that all these different ethnic groups can be part of one China that you can be um, Mongol or Manchu or Miao or Han and still be and also be a Chinese citizen that the, the, the state and in particular the communist state can transcend ethnicity and if you read early uh, communist newspapers, you'll find these uh, derogatory references to the, the Da Han, the, the, the big Han position of the nationalists. Now, in practice, this was never the case. In practice, the PRC has always been a deeply Han-centric state, one that assumes the normality of being Han Chinese, one in which Han customs are equated with Chineseness, but there was previously some space for ethnic expression. There was some room, often very limited, for people to have their own customs, for people to be educated in their own language, um, and there were Han Chinese who were interested in and dedicated to and participated in these these cultures. Um, as well as very frequent instances of clashes and repression and so on. So by the, by the 2000s or so, and I'm, I'm sweeping over a lot of things here, obviously, um, you have, I think, in the minds of the, the majority of Chinese, a sort of informal distinction between the, the troublesome people and the, the normalized people. So that a lot of ethnic groups, which are, in, in many cases, to be honest, um, just slightly arbitrary or Chinese who went into the hills, Chinese who, Chinese who were in a particular village region, Chinese who uh, adopted Islam. So um, a lot of these groups, particularly in the East, tended to be seen as very well assimilated and as really nothing different from being, say, uh, from, from being, say, from Yorkshire, if you're English. It's a distinct dialect, it's a distinct culture, but it's still part of the wider Englishness. And then you have these people who were conceived of simultaneously as being part of the state and as part of the territory, but as not essentially being Chinese. And that included the Tibetans, uh, the Uyghur, the, and to some extent, though it's mixed, the Mongols. So these peoples were conceived of by most Chinese a little bit like Native Americans were conceived of by Americans in, say, the 19th or much of the 20th century. They were people whose existence was somehow fundamental to the country. Um, the image of America was inseparable from Native Americans. But they were also not, they, but they were also in some deep respect not like us, alien, foreign, in need of being controlled, in need of being educated, in need of being in many cases, uplifted. And you'll see this constant language in Chinese propaganda that speaks of sort of lifting up these peoples, of civilizing them. And of course, this is all very reminiscent of, the, of colonization elsewhere, of the civilizing mission of the French, of the belief in of the treatment of Algerians by France, for instance. Now, you, in, in recent years, you've seen this sharp radicalization of ethnic policy and this deep desire to assimilate, this deep desire to make people be Chinese and be Han and adopt Han customs by uh, coercion, basically. So not just in Xinjiang, but um, across China, minority education has been 
or minority language education has been wiped out. So, for instance, um, take the, the, the Koreans. So the Koreans are a distinct minority in China, in northeast China. They're very well assimilated. They're, they're not seen as threatening. China has close ties with Korea, etc. Uh, both the Koreas now. But the number of Korean, and I'm, I'm remembering a figure here from a friend's research, the number of schools that provided education in Korean was reduced from about 52, 53 to 2 over the course of several years. So you've had this generalized program of, of, of assimilation, this development of like, uh, you, must be, you must be Han, you must be Chinese. And in some ways, this is picking up on earlier PRC programs that sought to crush or reduce local diversity among the Han population, that sought to say, you will speak Mandarin. You will behave in the ways that, uh, that Chinese people behave, which means adhering to a set of customs derived from a largely arbitrary center. When in, you then had the, the, the riots uh, in Xinjiang, which are very, it's very disputed what happened, but there was essentially an... In 2009. Uh, in 2009, right? sorry. Essentially an outbreak <clears throat> of ethnic violence, um, some of it perpetuated by young Uyghur men, some of it perpetuated in response by the state. And you had this... Uh, extremely violent, somewhere hundreds of people were killed. We don't know exactly how many. There was retaliatory violence of all kinds throughout the region. Um, we don't know how much, and this is something that we come back to again and again, is we don't know. We don't know the answers to so much about what is happening in the region. Um, and that, that was a big turning point in the view of Uyghur as truly not just alien but dangerous, but th threatening. And there had always been a little bit of an element here because the Uyghur are, uh, have one of the strongest senses of self-identity among, I think, any of the minority peoples. They have a strong sense of being a nation. They have a strong sense of... Set, they have a strong sense of not being Chinese. And in fact, they had set up two, like, nominally independent nations at yes. several points yeah, earlier. Yeah. And, yeah. and, I mean, and this varied, and, you know, lots of... There were Uyghur who wanted to assimilate. There were Uyghur who... Were, there were Uyghur who treated being Uyghur like uh, being, say, um, I don't know, like Indian American. Like, they were proud of their culture, they were proud of their history, but they were also... But they also felt a sense of, some sense of being Chinese. But... <laughs> It was a stronger sense than I think in, in other places. And the Uyghur also, and this is difficult to talk about, but I think important in understanding the way that the Chinese see them, the Uyghur became viewed as criminal. Um, because almost all, almost, the Uyghur look, this is, also the Uyghur look different from the Han. You can tell a Uyghur. You can't, you can't recognize, m many of the Chinese minorities are functionally indistinguishable ex except by dress and language from the majority from the, the Han population. And even the idea of a Han population, by the way, is, is kind of a, a fiction to begin with. But almost all crime in China is uh, ethnically based. That is, it's based, or not ethnically, it's locality based. It's based on who you, it's based on the, the people from your hometown. So there were Henan gangs, there were Hebei gangs, there were Shandong gangs, there were all these gangs that were basically um, comprised of people from one region or one locality across China. But, and there were Uyghur gangs, because like any other people, the, the, the Uyghur participated in criminal activity. But the Uyghur were recognizable. They stood out. They were distinguishable as being Uyghur. And so when they participated in fairly minor criminal activities, they were, they were stigmatized and they were drawn out by the Han majority as being distinctive and criminal. This is a process that obviously we've seen in America. We've seen it, with, seen it at various points with, with uh, African Americans, with Hispanics, that, that, that any action by the minority is seen as being evidence of their, of their inherently bad nature rather than just these people, these individuals. So that then, so that idea that the Uyghur were dangerous, that they were threatening, that they threatened Han life, became... Um, a mainstay of most Chinese of the thinking of most Chinese about the Uyghur. That in turn um, pre 
it, this produced a cycle of increasing oppression. This produced a cycle of increasing distrust. It had always been the case that it was difficult for Uyghur to get jobs. It was difficult for them even to get hotel rooms. Um, if you stayed, it was, it was hard even if you, had, if you were Han Chinese and your hukou, your residence permit, came from Xinjiang, you would be refused from many hotels. So um, this, cre this created this increasing climate of oppression and exclusion. This led in turn, and again, we don't know the extent, to increasing violence in Xinjiang, to what appears to be a long-running insurgency where um, some Uyghur have targeted the symbols of the Chinese state. There have been attacks, there have been, um, there have been we think, uh, community killings. Um, this violence was confined to some degree to Xinjiang. It began to, when it overspilled into the, the rest of China, um, there were particularly, a, there, were knife, there was a, a knife attack in Kunming that got huge publicity. And the idea that the Uyghur were, were terrorists became deeply implanted in the Chinese popular consciousness. The idea that the Uyghur were a dangerous people and uh, a threatening people. And that's still the image that dominates today. So until recently, the vast majority of Chinese knew nothing about the camps, or very little. Xinjiang is a long, long, long way away. It's not part of ordinary life. Now you have this government propaganda program that is pushing the idea that the camps are there for, re for education, for rehabilitation, and so on, which is, is nonsense. But I would say, and as far as we can tell at this point, most Chinese accept this model. They accept the idea that the Uyghur are dangerous, are threatening, and that they must be controlled, restrained, um, and in particular that young men, and the camps do not just contain young men, the camps contain people of all ages, of, of all stages of health, of all levels of education and profession, but the, but the view in particular is that young men are dangerous, young Uyghur men are dangerous. And we already saw Uyghur pushed almost entirely out of the rest of China, um, uh, expelled from other cities, expelled from other provinces, driven back to Xinjiang, where, of course, they, it's harder and harder for them to get work. Um, and so Chinese, or the majority of Chinese, not only don't have any contact with Uyghur, they're taught to almost see the presence of a Uyghur as a threat, as inherently dangerous. And this has coincided with a massive spike in fear throughout the Chinese system and a massive rise in oppression throughout the Chinese system so that um, it has become increasingly dangerous for any official to, to take on political risk because there are series of rolling purges that are claiming officials. So risk, so whereas before they might have been able to turn a blind eye to things or um, been more flexible, more willing, now um, now there's a real fear that if they, if, if, they allow, if they allow even an ordinary Uyghur person into their territory who, who does anything that is seen as political or dangerous, the local officials will also suffer. So I have a, a friend of a friend who um, is an extremely assimilated Uyghur woman. She's married to a Han Chinese man. She has a half Han child. She has a job in Tianjin where she, um, she works um, in a professional job. She speaks fluent Chinese. She went on holiday about a year and a half ago uh, to another Eastern Chinese city. As soon as she arrived in the hotel and checked in with her, her hukou, that's her, her ID card, that basically in this case, that, that says she uh, identifies her as, as Uyghur, Within half an hour, the police showed up. They imprisoned her and her son. Bear in mind, her son was, I think, six. They imprisoned them in the hotel, so a middle-aged a, a middle professional mother and her kid, for the entire week they were there, told them they couldn't leave, they couldn't talk to anyone, um, and then personally escorted them to put them on the plane back to their home city. So this is the level of, of fear and distrust of the system towards Uyghur at the moment, that there is no, um, that they are seen as, as a threat, a disease, uh, um, something inherently dangerous and unsettling. Thank you. And I think 
what's really clear about that is kind of the interplay between government propaganda, government thoughts about this, and then how that cycles back into how citizens think about it, and then again, how the government portrays things publicly. I wanted to ask, Ryan, because you wrote about this recently, talking about this sort of propaganda and the official government discussion of the camps. So before, the government was denying that these camps even existed. Mm -hmm. it, was, it was in August, right? There was a UN um, meeting about this, and they brought, the, they brought it up, and the Chinese spokesperson said, absolutely not, these camps don't exist. And now they've gone on record saying that they do exist in their vocational training facilities. Why, why did this change? And what, I guess, what differences are you seeing in sort of how, they're, how government outlets are discussing the camps domestically and how they're discussing them internationally? And, and can you tell us a little bit about kind of the propaganda goals there or the publicity goals, as you might want to say? Yeah, um, well, the, the, the camps have always been uh, acknowledged by government officials at one level or another. So as of six, eight, 12 months ago, um, they were mostly denied to the outside world. Um, but if you, if you look down at lower, lower levels of officialdom at more local um, uh, media outlets within Xinjiang, uh, there was a lot of bragging, a lot of proud displays of look, look at these wonderful, wonderfully effective um, disciplining camps that, that, we, that we have created. And, and so we have photos of a grand opening. We have um, the photo that's now pretty famous of, um, of a camp with all men sitting in very rigid straight lines with multiple layers of fences and uh, guards in, in kind of SWAT slash riot gear every um, maybe 10, 10 meters or so. Um, and you had many speeches and just, just a, lot of, a lot of pride from local officials who were trying to show those above them that they were not going easy <laughs> on these dangerous uh, threats to, to the CCP. Um, that they were not two-faced officials because there's a campaign uh, in place right now to find out who it is that's been successfully portraying themselves as loyal to the Communist Party all these years but actually has a secret... Um, uh, a secret desire for the party to be out of power or something like that. So the best way to show that you're not a two-faced official is to implement these harsh measures very strongly. So that's, that's where the propaganda stood at the local level. Meanwhile, at the same time, they're telling the outside world that they don't exist. Right. I think it just got to the point where there's just way too much evidence. With the satellite <laughs> photos, with the government publicized bids for construction contracts. I mean, there was just... Uh, recently, um, uh, uh, Ben Dooley at AFP did an analysis of government documents that found 181 of these camps um, documented in various published um, calls for employ employees and, and construction. So I think the evidence just got to be too, um, too big, and so they changed tack. And so you can see in the latest um, imagery that they've been putting out where they're saying these are lovely air-conditioned uh, skills training centers a change in how, what they're emphasizing. Whereas before, the photos emphasized these rigid rows of people who are being successfully disciplined and subordinated to the will of the state. You now have all these people going around, doing things uh, independently, dancing, doing artistic... Um, 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 yeah. just one thing, too, was that the story of the camps began to spread in the Muslim world. They began to get attention in Pakistan and Malaysia in particular. And in fact, the, one of the things we, we've seen with the shift has been that it took place, and it, a lot of it was initially dri um, being done by um, Chinese diplomatic personnel in those countries. So, I, so as well as the, Sorry, the what evidence, do you mean the shift was being done. The then? shift, so, so the the propaganda about like this is happy, this is good, okay. was being done by like the diplomatic attaché to Pakistan, um, and you have, and I think one of the crucial things was the realization that they needed to give Muslim allies a excuse. They needed to give them language that they could use to pretend that everything was okay. They couldn't go for full, they, they couldn't go for full denial. And I, they, they, needed, um, they needed something that uh, Pakistani leaders in particular could say, this is not about Islam, this is about terrorism. They could say, this is about, uh, this is about the good the Chinese are doing. And, 
and that the, um, I think that's been un, a little bit underplayed because we don't, most of us don't take part in these discussions. But it, but the discussion in the Muslim world and among the global umma and um, in in forums and so on suddenly became very fierce, and that's the the moment in which you see this propaganda flip. So I have a related question, and any of you should feel free to jump in. But that's you know there hasn't been a lot of there haven't been a lot of public statements from the governments of Muslim majority countries, right? So I think the the first kind of definitive thing I saw was anybody can correct me if I'm wrong. I think the presumed future prime minister of Malaysia mm-hmm. had some had some harsh words, but you know he's not in the he's not the prime minister yet. And I just haven't seen you know, the, the Organization of Islamic Cooperation has not issued, or last, last, last time I checked, have not issued any public statements. So why, why aren't any of these governments publicly speaking out? Well, well I mean, I, I don't think that the Muslim-majority s- states are in any way particular in this. I mean, the, there have been a lot of statements of, well, where, where's the Muslim world and where's... Muslim solidarity. Well, the, the unity of the Muslim world is, is highly exaggerated. <laughs> and it's about as strong as the unity of, say, the Western human rights world, where we also haven't seen any governments make an official statement. We've had officials <laughs> or gov- working for governments make statements, uh, like Marco Rubio, but we haven't had the President of the United States. I guess the State Department, U.S. State Department, has made some pretty official statements in some, some places. But... The UN has not condemned them, uh, condemned these uh, these things. So uh, I think what we're just seeing is a is a general unwillingness to condemn uh, PRC behavior um, merely for the sake of some uh, nation's purported value system. I don't know, though. I think you look at the degree to which people to which there has been people have spoken up about the Rohingya, or the or obviously about Palestine, though the. That's a long-running, um, a long-running issue and one with its own <coughs> deeply tangled politics. And I, uh, and there's been, you know, especially at a time when when uh, increasingly Muslim Muslim politicians have been portraying themselves as defenders of the faith. Uh, when they when we're seeing this kind of call to to um, for Muslim unity and so on from leaders who are using this as a populist platform in their own countries, in, in Indonesia, um, in Malaysia. It, I, th- I think there is a legitimate, then that it does become a legitimate question, well, why aren't you speaking up for, for these Muslims? Um, and, I mean, the answer is that um, China has a lot of money and power, I, um, fundamentally. And that it, but that also, because the Uyghur have been shut out from the <coughs> global community for so long, there's no sense of their presence. There's no sense of them as as kind of kindred or brothers, except to some degree in Turkey, where there's which has had the longest and the strongest connections with the um, with the Uyghur world, and where even there the the uh, there have been some voicing, but it's been very restrained compared to even five or ten years ago when Erdogan was saying much I much stronger things about the Uyghur cause. So, looking at this idea of are, is, are other governments remaining silent? Let's talk about also individuals who are being pressured to remain silent. And I was wondering if you could talk at all about some of the ways in which the, the Chinese government may pressure individual Uyghurs who you know, are living abroad, maybe they're citizens of the place they're living, but they still are afraid to speak out. I know for, when, you, when we testified before Congress earlier this year, you, you said for a while you also did not want to speak out, but then... You know, you decided you had to, but what what are some of the ways that the Chinese government is pressuring people to stay silent? Right now, everybody knows Chinese used most uh, uh, detect system to control Uyghur region, even in your outside. But your relatives, your uh, parents in the uh, China, so they're living there in danger. So we don't want to put them more in danger. That's why we, uh, most of the Uyghurs outside, even we hear our relatives or parents being harassed or uh, even taken to the re-education camps. 
they choose to silence because they don't want to uh, much more worse things happening to them. Uh, Chinese government using like technology everywhere, even your phone. So the every right now the community have uh, community workers and the policies. They house by house, one by one, collecting who is in the house, who is not in the region, mm. who is outside of the region. So they force the parents or the uh, the people uh, giving uh, the information about their relatives outside. So they have phone numbers mm -hmm. somehow, and they have the even the addresses. So the Chinese police call them from the China to overseas wow. those uh, kids who are studying about or the living. Uh, such as me mm -hmm. in the U.S., they even call us and the sending the parents' picture with them sitting in the house, says, oh, we're visiting your parents. They're with me, so you should keep quiet. So we received so many phone calls from the young uh, students aboard. They said, we don't know what to do. we just receiving this kind of call and the threatening. They forced to us giving uh, some information about um, Uyghur activities, you know, what's going on in the outside of the region, uh, what's, what's in their mind, mm -hmm. what they do, even who is close friend with who, like those kind of questions. They really like, like uh, putting so much uh, to collecting those information about us. That's why uh, we are even not in the region. We are also affected by this um, policy as a Uyghur, uh, for example, um, me, for like as a sister, as a daughter, as a, just a friend, as a journalist. So every day we're publishing similar story so our about our elites, we were elites being sent to the re-education camps. Someone is my father's best friend. Another day I publish news about my friend. Even someone is my professor in the college. And someone is friend of me. And every day we too much to absorb. And the living with this, it's very hard. So, but we don't have a choice because we are the only voice for the voiceless people. So we have to hold ourselves, our emotion. So we need, we need to work more harder to against this like crime against humanity. What Chinese government doing is crime against humanity. It's not religion issue. It's not any other crime, criminal issue. They treat every Uyghurs, every uh, person who has religion thought, treating them just like diseases. They think they need to brainwash in those re-education camps. They call re-education camps. But we have some Evidence can prove this is not like they propaganda, mm -hmm. like re-education camps. Torture inside, abuses inside, and uh, God knows what's happening right now. So many dead cases we already uh, heard about who dies in the education camps, even they don't give the body to the uh, the home. The government uh, built so many cremation centers in the region. The most of the population in Xinjiang, uh, East Turkestan, is Uyghur and Kazakhs. All those uh, majorities in the region are all Muslims, like about 80%. 90% of them Muslims. 
we don't have that much cremation centers because we don't need it. We bear body different way. So why they want to build those cremation? It's, it's like I cannot think, you know, it's useful like for government. We don't have that much Han Chinese in the villages. Some villages is 98, 95% Uyghurs living. So why they build those cremation? So it's we should to think about it. And then we find out those information in the government web pages, Chinese government web pages. From, uh, from 2016, they uh, start building those cremation centers. And uh, some of them already being used. And uh, can we connect it? with these cases like cremation center with the dead body not returning to the homes? I don't know. We don't have uh, evidence to prove. We don't have uh, pictures to prove. But can we put those information together? It's like horrible. It's it's terrible situation uh, the, the people facing over there. And then the, mostly the kids thousands, hundreds of thousands kids becoming orphanage because of both parents taking to the re-education camps. And then they build so many um, orphanage houses in every counties. Even that, because of too crowded, they use uh, orphanage houses uh, as uh, or, uh, some schools, like as uh, orphanage uh, houses. So all those come together. So what's next? We don't know. So like as uh, Ryan mentioned, we have enough evidence to prove, yes, Chinese government is doing something like against humanity, they criming against uh, humanity and they comment to the, what is it called, uh, cultural genocide. So, well, people should know, honestly, a lot of what we do know is because of Radio Free Asia's really good work. You guys were the first ones to report mm -hmm. on this and I know it's really challenging. It's, it's got to be really emotionally It's challenging, every becoming day. more challenging because yeah. uh, you cannot uh, connect with inside with phone anymore. They shut down the internet after uh, the July uh, 5th, 2009, the Urumqi incident happened. They shut down 10 months, whole internet, full cones. At that time, the world didn't pay that much attention to this situation. Uyghurs had been so many times facing those kind of like policies, harshly crackdowns. Mm, this time, because this this amount of people affected, it's so huge, very huge. We just est roughly estimate like two to three million people may affect it. But even this number is last year's estimate, right? Right. <laughs> so we heard some uh, up from the officials. They said the government order uh, to police station or the uh, local govern government uh, officers says, you have to put 40% of the population to the e re-education camps. Right now, the Chinese estimate Uyghur people like around 11 to 13 million people. So if they plans to re-educate 40%, then it means more than 3 million then. So we don't know the exactly the <coughs> number, but I wonder 
So where they can put that much people? So how whole world couldn't realize what Chinese right. doing in this right. like time? You know, we have we can like use any technology to actually research. So what's going on in there? But in Xinjiang area, the East Turkestan area, very closed <coughs> from the outside. So we, as we know, very, very few people could out from the, uh, the facilities, re-education camps. If I can just ask, I think, mm -hmm. Ryan, you've been taking notes furiously. Is there something you wanted to add? Yeah, I just wanted to reemphasize some of the things that mm -hmm. Gulce Harar is talking about and, and put it in, try, to, try to put it in some kind of perspective because it's very hard to understand what a million, what that means to have a million. I think it's a, the estimates are something like a million in, in enclosed re-education and then possibly as much as three million in um, if you count the day uh, re-education. Um, if, you, if you meet an Uyghur person, they have friends and relatives in the camps. I mean, that's just, that's just about guaranteed. Uh, um, uh, so, you know, it, it, I, I, don't, I don't want anyone to leave thinking that maybe Gulchira is like a, a spectacular case no. of, of, of this. This is, this is everyone. everyone. And... and um, People, Uyghurs outside of China are living, almost all of them, with a tremendous sense of guilt because they have, uh, they have survived and they've gotten out. You know, one of the strange things about, about this um, attack on an, on an ethnic group, both physically and, and its culture, is that the Chinese state does not want the Uyghurs to leave. It's not a case of, we don't want you here. It's a case of you must stay here and you must be like us. You must become us. So it's, it's, it's only a, a, a kind of a rare stratum of people who were able to get out in the first place. Um, and, and those who managed to find themselves by luck outside of China when all of this uh, settled and it, and it became truly impossible for pretty much any Uyghur to leave, leave China are dealing with a tremendous sense of of guilt, and a lot of them are dealing with an immediate question of how to preserve their own freedom and their own lives, because uh, the Chinese government is not renewing passports of Uyghurs abroad, and so they are sitting on a, 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 a clock that's ticking down. Uh, after and when it when it hits zero, they have to figure out what they're going to do, and they don't want to apply for asylum because they believe that the Chinese government will find out and that more of their relatives, in addition to the ones already in the re-education camps, will then go to the re-education camps um, themselves. Um, so, and, and the people that this is happening to, it's very, it's, 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 it's very tragic. They're often the people who were most invested in the system as it existed as of, say, 2014 or 15. That's when they got their visa to, say, come to America. They're the ones who were really, really well behaved. And I, I talk to them and they say, I don't know why this is happening to me. I'm not a criminal. I didn't do anything wrong. And I have to say, look, I believe you. I, I really believe you didn't do anything wrong. It's very hard to get out of China without having a stellar record of, of, of you know, loyalty on your sleeve to the, uh, to, to the party. I have to tell them, look, this is, this is what the party thinks you are by virtue of being, uh, by virtue of, of being uh, Uyghur. And the, the words that Gul Chihar used, disease of the brain, these are the words coming out of party officials' mouths right now. Mm -hmm. We need to eliminate the tumors. We need to eliminate the weeds. We need to cure the disease that's infecting their brains. Um, these, are, these are phrases called from Chinese officials uh, a very proud statements on, on local uh, uh, local media. So, um, yeah, I, I wanted to just make that sort of both personal and wide. I think um, I just want to talk a little bit about the, the actual process of doing journalism in around Xinjiang and why RFA's work has been so hugely impressive uh, for the rest of us as as journalists in in China. Um, all of my Uyghur sources are gone. <laughs> uh, 
Ike. I can't talk to people because they're gone. I cannot reach them. I can't reach people like... Even, even Han Chinese in Xinjiang, who were sources for people I knew, have been arrested while talking to them. Uh, uh, most, um, the, even the people, so the people who I've been unable to reach who have disappeared from from WeChat, from QQ, from other contact sources who are not answering email. The, uh, at a, um, some months ago, I some months ago, I and most other foreign journalists stopped trying to reach Uyghur sources at all because the even the act of contacting them was likely to put them um, at risk of being sent to the camps. Uh, when. Um, So I have had, and I think we've, I think really in particular has had these conversations, and I'm sure God has two conversations with students abroad who were saying, I am being told that I must go back because if I do not go back, my parents will be sent to the camps, my brother will be sent to the camps. And I think we're all giving the same answer to them uh, uh, of some kind, which is, you will be sent to the camps anyway, and your parents will be sent to the camps anyway because you have had contact with foreigners, and that is seen as being one of the most dangerous possible things. And you, you know, and however heart-rending and awful a decision it is, you must, you, you cannot go back. Uh, you must, for your own sake and for the sake of your, and for the sake of your culture and your people, stay abroad. Which is asking people to make an enormous sacrifice because. Um, the loss of home, um, the loss of a country, and uh, even even for many people, the loss of China, it, because be, the, these are there are people who are invested in, in Xinjiang and it's the region as a place in its beauty and its culture and so on. But there were also people who saw themselves as being Chinese, who believed that they were part of a, a who are in the situation. Um, who are in the situation of Jews who believed they were German, um, that they have, have had by their own state, their own state has stripped away the, 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 the beliefs they had, the, the structure they had. <coughs> and so um, we're, we're turning, when it comes to coverage, you know, we, we're turning increasingly because we cannot have these personal connections and we cannot have these personal sources and um, uh, we're turning to uh, open source data or we're turning we're, we're looking at procurement documents we're looking at satellite images um, we're trying all these methods to essentially get around the problem that there's this um, that not only is there this hole but there's this fear and this fear is only one part of the fear that is that pervades Chinese sources at the moment, and while for most areas it isn't as bad, um, every Western journalist and every Chinese journalist I've spoken to, in fact, over the last year, two years, has seen every source move from the people who would talk to us. The people who would talk to us on the record will now only talk to us off the record. The people who would talk to us off the record won't talk at all, and that's across the board in China. That's every. That is almost every topic. Um, and a lot of what we're seeing in Xinjiang, it is playing out in a particularly horrific and terrible form. <laughs> but it, it is, to some degree, a spike or an intensification or a particularly cruel application of programs or trends that are visible across the Chinese system. So we've seen this, so this campaign against any form of Islamic practice was, uh, comes in the context of of a mass campaign against religion elsewhere. The, clo the, the paranoia, the fear about any contact with the West, we're seeing um, officials having to provide hour-by-hour -hour schedules when going abroad. We're seeing people who have had contact with foreigners 
being um, purged or expelled from positions because of that conduct. We're seeing exchanges shut down. So while, while Xinjiang is the crisis zone, it is the absolute worst, and it exceeds um, anywhere else in China except perhaps Tibet, and we don't know enough about Tibet. Um, it is, it, it's, not, it, it, it's not happening in isolation. It's happening as part of a, of a deep... Uh, a deep reactionary, a deeply paranoid and um, increasingly vicious um, mood across China. I think that's a really good place to stop our, our sort of discussion here, putting that in context of what's happening in China more generally. And, and thank you all for sharing your very emotional stories. Um, I'm going to open up now to questions. I'd like to give right a first refusal to our co-host here in the front, if someone would like to bring him a mic. Thank you. This is a terrific discussion. Oh, I'm Jerry Cohen, NYU U.S. Asia Law Institute. Uh, this is a wonderful discussion. I'm grateful to the China file. Uh, organizers and also to Radio Free Asia, which has done so much to expose this problem. Uh, I have a few questions, but first a comment. Uh, the Chinese government is not only violating various treaties to which it is committed through ratification, uh, not just the torture convention, uh, but the International Covenant on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights, which previously it always showed the world it was a shining star in implementing. And here, these are disgraceful violations and the Racial Discrimination Treaty, etc. But it sometimes said that recently the Chinese government just legitimized its detention. Uh, in Xinjiang. That's nonsense. All they did was to uh, authorize the establishment of these institutions. They have not authorized legal detention of most of the people. Mm -hmm. uh, in order to do that, they'd have to pass a law or lock everybody up under the criminal justice system. And they're not doing that. Most people are arbitrarily, illegally detained. Now, I have some questions. I, every day I hear new rumors or reports, and I don't know to which ones we can credit. Uh, we've just come from a meeting at NYU this afternoon, which showed photographs of three women reportedly being forced into marriage yeah. with Han men. I'd like to hear more about that. I have not heard about that before. There was a report last week that some of the prisoners in the detention uh, facilities are being shipped out to other prisons in northeast China yes. and being replaced by Han prisoners from there. And that would be a more effective way of thought reform. Mm -hmm. If you're imprisoned every day with Han prisoners who can play very rough with you, it makes imprisonment even worse than it has been. So I'd like to know about that. I haven't heard anything about the Hui people. The Hui are Muslims, and to what extent are they suffering under the current regime? Now the question is, of course, what is to be done? Uh, I think the recent racial discrimination uh, hearing at the UN was helpful. November 6th, we'll have the Universal Periodic Review for China. And although that's absurdly limited in the amount of time any witness can have or any government, it's still an important occasion. And I think we have to make something of it. Unfortunately, the US withdrawal from the Human Rights Council of the UN and China's increasing manipulation of the authoritarian governments that are members of the Human Rights Council make it difficult uh, to do something uh, there. Uh, I think the Magnitsky Act needs to be implemented. We hear from various senators, etc. they're preparing to do something, 
to impose sanctions on those responsible for the horrors uh, in China. Well, who's really responsible? Xi Jinping, that's where the buck stops. But nobody dares to think we could impose sanctions on him. But I think it would be very effective to have a public discussion of this, because he's the boss. And if sanctions are to be imposed against Chun Chenguo because he's carrying out the orders, we should think about sanctions for the great leader who's telling him what to do. So unfortunately, the United States is not ideally poised to defend the Muslims. <laughs> uh, we have a track two dialogue with China coming up soon on human rights. And we insist that they discuss Xinjiang. And they finally agreed under pressure, because otherwise we wouldn't go. But then they say they want to discuss what we're doing to the Muslims and their children in this country. So we have to improve our own situation. But we have to focus now on action. What can be done? Because we don't know how this is going to end. Mm -hmm. I can see compromises on the South China Sea, even on North Korea, East China Sea. But how is this going to end? This is an attempt to transform people that's destined to fail. When I think about Chairman Mao trying to tell the young people of China they can become new socialist people, and we see how pathetic that exercise was, it reminds me of the attempt in this country by some people to transform gay people into heterosexual people. It is destined to fail. Well, on that note, let's, uh, let's let some of our panelists ask your questions. So I, I'm pretty sure that RFA was the one that reported about um, prisoners in these camps in Xinjiang being shipped out to, into inner China yeah. and vice versa. And, but I, hadn't, I also didn't know much about the forced marriages. And anybody who wants to talk about what we've heard or not heard about the Hui would be welcome. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, we reported about that issue, the forced marriage between uh, Uyghur girls with Han Chinese. But you cannot see much Han Chinese uh, girls married to Uyghur boys because most of the young population of the Uyghurs all in re-education camps. Only left behind is uh, older generation or the younger kids or the girls. So right now, Chinese government using, um, what is it called? Uh, oh, relative. the uh, uh, fictive relative. Relative. The making people into relatives. Relative uh, yeah. policy. So Chinese officers, one Chinese uh, officials have to have some Uyghur uh, relatives, they sign paper, each other becoming political relatives, <laughs> forcedly. So they send those people into Uyghur's house, they living together. They call five together, says sleeping together, eat together, education together, work together, and what is it called? I forgot. <laughs> so five together. So they really doing this. We, we did several uh, uh, news about this. We uh, uh, talked to the officials. We also talked to the uh, people in the villages. They said they really are uh, just living in the same room. They sleep in the same room. <laughs> they have to uh, prepare meals together. And the funny ways the, the signed paper was saying they have to responsible each other. If some uh, one part of the relatives have some financial issues or marriage issues, and then another part should uh, like between them, they have to yeah. So include that says. If these two families have somebody have didn't marry, so they have to uh, encourage their kids to marry each other, even like that. So 
there is forcing because they don't have choice I if you rejected to give your daughter to the Chinese officials you were you will become two faces people or betrayed or you have something I against the Chinese government but funny ways you cannot see any Chinese girl married to Uyghur man what is that so recently I received one message from inland China this girl is Han Chinese girl she was in love with one Uyghur boy then she become Muslim second word to the Islam they want to get married they went to Xinjiang but the government didn't issue them the marriage uh, certificate and then they find out the Uyghur boy several years ago uh, went to somewhere so if you travel to a board it is uh, <coughs> one of the uh, crime right now you will uh, be uh, you have to be educated because you went somewhere before so right now her boyfriend and uh, uh, his mother also uh, in the education camps so okay. she was asking helping from us what what can I do <coughs> she says so it's uh, like very different you know the one hand they forcing we were girls to married Han Chinese, on the one hand, they don't want to Han Chinese girl married the Uyghur. The, the Uyghur and the Han Chinese between marriage uh, in the, among the uh, China, uh, like less than 1%, they, uh, the official says in the one, uh, one kind of Milletle journal, right? Mm -hmm. What is it? So I read about that article uh, writing uh, by the Chinese officials who are researching about this marriage between the a minority to majority. So the Uyghur people is the less. <laughs> so this has become issue when Qin Chenguo rule began to rule Xinjiang. He was saying why still not seeing the, uh, the marriage yeah, between and Chinese to Uyghur, so we have to f uh, fix this problem. It seems for him is the problem. Let me let mm -hmm. me just. I'm going to collect a bunch of questions, and so then maybe we can try to answer them. Uh -huh. So we'll we'll put a pin in the the Hui one and the, the prison one. But I think there's a question here up front, and we'll just take a couple right in a row. Minky Warden from Human Rights Watch. Uh, thank you to the panelists and to China File for organizing such an important and um, obviously emotional panel. Uh, I w we've talked about what next, and, and Professor Cohen asks, of course, the right question, what, what the world should do. But I think we also need to understand how the Uyghur population ended up in these camps. And you alluded to this, the, fa the incredibly important reporting on China File by uh, Darren Byler which outlined a years-long campaign that Human Rights Watch has also documented, uh, where nearly a million Han Chinese have been conscripted to live with Uyghur families. Mm -hmm. And the logical explanation is that many of the Uyghur families or family members who've ended up in these camps are there because um, of documentation by party officials. Mm -hmm. So it's, uh, it's, it's actually a, it's an ecosystem of repression. And I think it's very important to understand that that is ongoing, which is why the camps will continue to fill up. Mm -hmm. And um, this is, of course, consistent with uh, decades of repression, uh, the arrest of Rebia Kadir, Ilham Toti, even the Uyghurs who had worked within the system as businesswomen or as academics eventually eventually became enemies of the state. Mm -hmm. So uh, just to pick up on Professor Cohen's question, this is criminalization of identity. And I think the, the <coughs> understanding of that is, uh, gives us the grounds for uh, proceeding to uh, attempt to deal with it. Thank you. Who else? Right there in the third row, fourth row. Some number of rooms. Sui, Human Rights in China. I also want to follow up on Professor Cohen's question about the transportation of uh, Uyghur detainees out of China and um, uh, Han prisoners into Xinjiang. 
I mean, out of Xinjiang and into Xinjiang. Um, could it indicate a, a, a switch in policy of an attempt to thin out um, uh, Uyghurs in Xinjiang? Uh, but instead, uh, instead of having them assimilate into Han areas, have them segregated and uh, imprisoned. Um, this has been something I've been wondering about since the start of the campaign, in terms of like where does this go? And so we have a, a we have some models from the past about repressive states and uh, repressive communist states that China has also uh, knows about and draws on. And one of the patterns we saw, of course, in the Soviet Union was, the, um, was the, the breakup of peoples, was moving them away from sensitive areas to other areas where they, where they were uh, either dispersed among the local population, like, for instance, Koreans, um, Koreans were moved away from the Korean border where they were considered a threat to Kazakhstan, uh, where they were a minority among a minority, um, which is why there's actually excellent Korean food in Kazakhstan today. But as a byproduct of repression, not ideal. Um, <laughs> And so I think you, I, so what are the possible models? One of the, one of the, I think, the elements playing into the repression has been the Belt and Road Project. And I mean here the original Belt and Road Project, not the, the sort of, which, this is a term which now describes basically every part of Chinese <laughs> foreign policy. But originally it was a Eurasia connectivity project pushed heavily by Xi um, that consisted of two parts, the Belt and the Road. Now, naturally, the road went over the sea and the belt went over the land. And the route goes through Xinjiang. And so, and this is a route on which, this is a project on which an enormous amount of political capital has been staked in China, in which, which has become a loyalty signal to Xi Jinping. Everybody has, you get all this language about how great it is so that people can signal how loyal they are to Xi. And so you have this, this um, tumultuous, this, restive population in this area sitting right on this route. Um, and so one of the possibilities has always seemed to me basically the breakup of the Uyghurs of people and the moving of them away from Xinjiang into several different pockets around China. Now the problem with that is that you've had such demonization, such deep demonization of the Uyghur that local, that it would require the central government to absolutely impose its will on, on the provinces that took them because there's no way that they would accept these populations otherwise. They would be, they would be seen as a, a mark of extreme political risk. Um, but I wonder if this is, I wonder particularly as the, as, and I do think there has been some, there may be some positive results just from the eye of the world being drawn to some extent to the camps, whether we're going to see a shift in policy towards this kind of breakup, towards this idea of sort of um, physically, um, separating and dissolving the Uyghur as a cohesive population. But the truth is we don't know. Um, it's, we, it's very hard to tell what the long-term out outcome is. They also may just be taking the old, old lesson of empire, which is that you divide and rule. You send the, you say, um, again, going to the Soviet Union, I remember being in Estonia. Um, who did the Soviets send, to, who did the Soviets send to guard Estonia? They sent the Uzbeks because the Uzbeks had no connection to the local population and were completely alien. They sent the Estonians doing military service to guard Central Asia. And so I, I wonder if you're just going to see, I wonder if there's just an element of these people will be more controllable when they're not being ruled by their own, when they're not being controlled by their own. <coughs> You've, you also have this terrible element, of course, that you, and we've seen little bits of this, that the Uyghur being forced to participate in their own oppression. So a lot of the so guards, security personnel, and so on, are often Uyghur. And we've had some reports, and we can't speak to the accuracy, of people being threatened with the camps if they do not participate in the process mm. of guarding the camps. Mm. Um, but that seems, if I were a, a Chinese security official, I would see that as an inherently unstable and dangerous proposition anyway. Uh, I would like to mention something in here. Uh, let's don't forget when the person who take into the re-education camps, first they do is body check, full. Uh, they take in uh, blood samples. They take in DNA samples. What they doing with that? So we know 
uh, the organ harvesting going on in the mainland China. Can we connect it with this? We should think about it. So we uh, hear something from uh, outside. Some um, people say, uh, even some Chinese website says we have right now just commercial coming up, like we have halal organs. So where those organs come from? Who is halal? <laughs> I think um, so. one, of the, one of the problems with all of this is that the um, intensity of fear is such that we can't, with some of this, we don't know what is uh, authentic and what are rumors produced by fear. And in fact, I, we hope, I think in many cases, that these are um, rumors produced by fear because the, if they are real, it seems th even more terrible. But there's always been this intense, both among the Han and the Uyghur, this intense rumor mongering, and this intense exchange of stories and, uh, and fears that often cropped up in the Han population as something that the Uyghur did, or um, mm. among the Uyghurs, something that the Han did. Like, and, so, um, and so it's very difficult for us to tell. And I think it's incredibly hard for us to tell like, what's the line between yeah. um, what's the fear, goal? rumor, and, and yeah. reality. What is the goal of Chinese government doing this? What um, yeah, I, I think an, a, another problem with this, um, you know, with all of this not knowing is that um, sometimes some issues which probably deserve a lot of attention don't, don't get it. For example, the, uh, uh, the, forced, the forced marriages. Mm -hmm. That's a very difficult story to tell in a factually grounded evidence-based way in a journalistic venue, where you have to first set up the scene and say, well, in order to prove to you that these marriages are compelled, I, I first want to prove to you Anything that an official suggests that maybe you should do is, in fact, a, a compulsion in this environment. Because if you show any reluctance at all, you may be sent to the camps for that, for that reason. And so that becomes very hard to, to sum up and put in a, a good fact-checkable um, bit. And so when you're writing for a public audience, you ju you're just tempted to leave it out because we've already got, you know, 5 to 10 percent of, of the Uyghurs in in camps, and that's enough to convey the horror of this. But that, you know, I think a lot of Uyghurs are actually upset that there hasn't been much reporting on the uh, forced um, marriages, and that and that's a product of our inability to access solid information, and our pro a product of the inability of audiences outside of of Xinjiang itself to to understand the magnitude um, of the situation. So I think. You know, a lot of us, when we're writing for a publication, tend to stick to what's, you know, really, what we can really hit solidly because it's so, so big. As for the moving of prisoners, this is something that came, I think, exclusively from RFA. It's a great demonstration of what RFA does that other uh, news outlets don't, and that is they, they, they do cold calls in Uyghur and Chinese to police stations, um, to, to, to uh, uh, party offices, uh -huh. and ask and ask officials questions. And it's surprising how often officials are willing to, to talk. Um, and this, for this uh, shipping people out, they, they managed to get um, people at the prison receiving the, the Uyghurs in the Northeast to, to talk, and the people in the prison sending them, or in the region sending, the uh, prefecture sending them okay. to talk. The idea of sending Han people back, I think, only came from somebody in the town. I, I don't think that's... Um, and RFA didn't say that was happening. They just quoted this guy in the town. So we don't know. We don't have good evidence of sending Han people back. But we have pretty strong evidence that they're sending people out there. And then just very briefly to hit the Hui question, uh, there are a lot of reports of Hui being in the camps in very small numbers. Um, but uh, it's also notable that uh, attempts to control and reshape and Chinify. I say Chinify and not Sinify because they actually have a neologism in Chinese for this, Zhongguo Hua. Mm -hmm. And uh, to Chinify Islam, which is now an official policy, um, and, it's, and you can see it in places like Ningxia where they recently changed the name of a river, where they removed uh, domes from mosques because they look too 
um, Middle Eastern. So this is this is spreading, and there is a there is an Al Islamophobic element mm -hmm. um, to to what's going on here. So. I think we're going to have to end this, but I want to thank all of you, and I hope all of you will join me in thanking our panelists. Um, this is thank you. Thank you again, everybody, for attending.